This story is brought to your ears by all our fantastic supporters on Patreon. To get in the action yourself with bloopers, extras, and the occasional early story, join us at patreon.com slash voiceofallmtg. We'd like to thank our newest patrons, Taya, Adorable Kitten, Austin Richardson, and Trevor Lennon for already donating. For more stories or just a chat, visit voiceofallmtg.com. And now, Voice of All presents The Gathering Storm, Chapter 11 by Django Wexler. Nivix was never truly quiet. Even in the dead of night, there was always some inventor who couldn't sleep scratching new designs at a drafting table, some chemister working around the clock to meet a funding deadline. But normally, the building at least slowed down after midnight, the hallways emptying out except for the Scorchbringer guards and watchful automata. Even madmen needed rest eventually. But not tonight, or any of the nights in the week since the disaster at the Guild Summit. Huge banks of lights turned darkness into broad daylight, while misium generators in the bowels of the building hummed and sparked. Every desk was full, every laboratory, every testing chamber, the air full of the smell of ink and fumes and hot metal. When workers collapsed, they were dragged away to makeshift barracks in the halls, laid out on blankets and given a few hours rest before being revived with coffee and sent back to work. And, perhaps uniquely in the history of the Guild, all that effort was bent toward a single goal. Committees had ceased meeting. Bureaucratic infighting between the different laboratories had been put on hold. A thousand bickering geniuses had had their heads cracked together until they were all pointing in at least approximately the same direction. Word had come down from the top, from the very top, that every resource the Izzet possessed was at Ral Zarek's disposal, and anyone who got in his way would answer to the fire mind. Ral hadn't left his office since his return from New Prov. Meals were brought in, changes of clothes, fresh rolls of drafting paper, and the outputs of a hundred other offices for collation and combination. He had long since lost track of the time, or even the day. He worked until he could no longer force his eyes open, then put his head down on his desk and slept until he was woken by the next delivery or disaster. While he slept, he dreamed. Raoul remembered being torn into pieces so small as to be invisible, flowing through a sea of strange energies and twisted space, and reassembled bit by agonizing bit. He opened his eyes, and found himself face down on a sewer grate. It had a strange brass design, not like the Toverna's wrought iron, and the walls around him were sunburnt brown brick instead of grey stone. Rain was falling, pounding up and down his back, and a stream of water ran past him and down to the sewers. Raoul could see a streak of crimson in it and felt a sharp pain in his side. Oh, oh that's, that's right. right. He put his hand to the wound, felt blood pulsing wetly against his palm. That, that boy, boy stabbed, stabbed me. me. And, and then, then I, I made, made it, it home and... Elias. Thunder rumbled overhead, and the sky flickered. Well, you're dressed pretty nice to be lying in a gutter. Yeah, someone's having a bad night. Bad for him. Good for us. Raoul sat up with an effort. There were two men leaning against the wall of the alley, watching him with amused, unhurried expressions. Their clothes were strange loose, flowing shirts and trousers, but he recognized their manner at once. Thugs were thugs no matter where you traveled. And where have I traveled? Some magic had taken him, that was for certain. Ugh. Wha- what district is this? District? This man was the shorter of the two. You must be from way out of town. Figured him for a merchant. From... 
somewhere they dress like that without anyone laughing at them, I suppose. Raoul shuffled to his knees, his hair beaten flat against his skull by the pounding rain. He forced words out through gritted teeth. Where am I? The taller man strolled forward. Where you are, friend, is deep in the dung heap. Now it's been nice chatting with you, but you might have noticed it's pissing down out here, and I for one would like to off somewhere warm and dry and full of drinks. So, hand over what's in your pockets, then strip off those nice things, and we'll leave you as healthy as when we found you. His hand went to his pocket and came out with a knife. His partner drew one as well, the steel blade shining as lightning crawled across the sky overhead. No. That seems like a mistake to me. So I'm going to give you one more chance to think things over. Boom. Flash and the thunder were simultaneous, the lightning bolt snaking down through the rooftops to earth itself in the flowing water of the alley. Ral felt heat washing over him, power running through him like fire in his blood. His hair frizzed and stood on end, and when he smiled, sparks arced between his teeth. Above him, the rain started to bend in gentle arcs, leaving a dry circle where he stood. Moments later, Ral left the alley, richer by two twisted, slightly melted knives, a couple of purses full of copper, and two pairs of still-smoking boots. Something was always exploding. Again, not an unusual state for Nivix, but the explosions were usually a little less frequent and accompanied with a little more fanfare. Most of the goblins believe that the best time to do a field test was at the grand unveiling, so that if whatever you were building blew up, at least everyone was there to see it. Now the blast shook the vast structure day and night. Hydromancers put out the fires, and workers descended on the stricken laboratory, hauling away the bodies and hammering the metal back into shape before it had even stopped smoking. Danger was irrelevant. Not that it was ever that relevant. And cost was no object. The work went on as the line sketched by Ral's frantic pencil took shape in arcs of misium and steel, and chemisters with soot-blackened faces hurried upstairs to report success or failure. Apprentice Needed. Ralph stared at the sign for a long while and sighed, but the profits from a couple of knives and pairs of boots only went so far and his stomach was rumbling. The tinkerer's workshop was two stories of crumbling brick, with a strange glass and steel contraption emerging from the roof. Lightning swirled inside a globe at the top, but only weakly and a gear train descending from the machine moved only in fits and starts. An old man, wearing a pair of goggles with one lens badly cracked, wrenched open the door when Ral knocked. Yes! The man shouted, then worked his jaw and swiveled one finger in his ear. What? I'm, uh, I'm here about the apprenticeship. Aren't you a little old to be an apprentice? The old man looked him up and down. I want to learn about machines. Machines were everywhere in this strange city, buzzing through the air and rolling along the streets. So many of them were powered by tame lightning that his power twinged in sympathy wherever he went. He'd been staring at them, fascinated since he'd arrived. <laughs> you and half the city. Can you pay the apprentice fee? No, but I can work. I can hire a boy to clean my scuttle and launder my drawers for a half bit. What else can you do for me? Ral raised his hand and concentrated. Power crackled in his fingertips, and then arced upward to the big globe. The lightning inside blazed with light, its weak glow strengthening until it was as bright as the sun. The chain of gears running down into the workshop started to spin, turning faster and faster, smoke rising from their bearings. Behind the old man, a metal whine rose to a shriek. 
and then something broke with a tremendous crash. The old man looked over his shoulder, then back at Rao. He smiled. You're hired. What do you want to learn? Everything you have to teach me. Rao ran one hand through his hair with a crackle. Hello! Hikara opened the door to Rao's office. Rao looked at her bleary-eyed. What? Just thought he could use a bit of, uh, you know, cheering up. She spread her arms. That's what mates are for, right? Kane. I don't have time. None of us have time. Oh, there's always time for a little fun, eh? Hikara spun gaily across the room. Her trailing hand caught a jar of pencils on the corner of Rao's desk, which tipped over, sending them rolling across the floor. Oops. Hikara! Hikara flinched, looking so chagrined that he paused and let out a breath. <sighs> Just... pick those up and... sit in the corner and try and stay very, very quiet. Can you do that? Ooh, like in hide and seek? Ah, oh, I'm terrible at that. Not like my mate Brevia, she's the best. We play down in the basement of the Flaming Whips, and it took me three weeks to find the spot where she'd hidden under the floorboards. <laughs> of course, she did whiff a bit by then. Hikara wrinkled her nose. Raoul leaned back in his chair with a sigh and closed his eyes. Harith was unlike Elias in almost every way. Tall and broad shoulders instead of willow slender, with a laborer's muscles and rough, calloused hands instead of a poet's dexterous fingers. Perhaps, Ralph thought, that was why he'd been drawn to him immediately, three drinks into a bad night in a cheap tavern. Or, perhaps, he was just the first person in a long time who seemed interested in talking to Rao instead of exploiting him. The room was Harris, much bigger than the rat trap Rao rented with the pitiful stipend Gaz, the old tinkerer, was willing to pay him. It was on the top floor of a red brick building, overlooking a neighboring alley spiderwebbed with clotheslines and hanging laundry. Harith kept the windows open for the hot, dry breeze. It meant that anyone in the alley could probably hear what they'd been up to, but Ralph found he didn't much care. Harith stood by the window, looking down, wearing only a sleeveless dressing gown. Ralph rolled onto his side to admire him, the hard planes of his body. The tight thatch of orange-red curls that felt just right when he curled his fingers through them. Sensing his regard, Harith looked over his shoulder and gave a lopsided grin. Thought you were gonna sleep until noon. Hangover? Surprisingly, no. Ral flopped onto his back. His own hair hung lank and disheveled with sweat. Just lazy. <laughs> what about old man Gaz? He's not gonna be mad you late? There was a long pause. Raoul stared at the ceiling for a moment, eyes tracing the spiderweb cracks in the plaster, trying to keep his racing heart under control. I never told you who I was working for. Harris swore under his breath. When he turned away from the window, his smile was broad and as false as a tin Zeno. I must have heard it somewhere. And that's why you talked to me. You need something. It's not like that. Just admit it. Raoul let out a deep breath and sat up, running his hand through his hair. Lightning crackled, restoring its frizz. What were you hoping to get from me? Harith looked at him, all cold calculation, no desire left in his eyes. The combination to the vault. Gaz has some toys that people I know will pay well for. And I was supposed to hand it over for a tumble and a pretty smile? Raoul... 30%. Harith blinked. What? That's my cut. 30%. 10. I'm the one taking all the risk. 25. Gaz will know it was me, and I won't be able to get another apprenticeship. <laughs> Besides, you should have been honest with me from the beginning. 
Harith looked like he'd been sucking on a lemon, but he nodded. Twenty-five. You're not... you're not worried about having to leave gas? Ral forced his features into a carefully engineered smile. I don't have anything left to learn from him. The walk up to the airy seemed especially long when you had to make it in the middle of the night in response to the fire mite's peremptory summons. Ral rubbed his eyes, feeling deep bags under them from lack of sleep, and grit his teeth. In his wake, a dozen goblins carried long rolls of paper under their arms, hurrying to keep up with his purposeful strides. When they reached the great doors that led to niv sanctum, Ral gestured for his assistants to stop. I'll call when I need you. What? What if the fire mine devours you? Then I'll scream, and you can take the rest of the day off. He pushed the doors open. Niv Mizzet sat on his haunches in front of the great window, among the arcane detritus and machinery of his airy, several books hovering in the air in front of him. They carefully bookmarked and stacked themselves on a table as the dragon's long neck swung around to face Ral, fins flaring. Ral Zarek, I have been waiting for your report. My apologies, Guildmaster. The situation has been... confused. I dare say. It is not every day the Supreme Judge of the Azorius is assassinated under our noses. Niv's head snaked closer, breath a hot wind on Ral's face. But I require answers, not excuses. Of course. Our representatives have visited every guild since the, uh, incident at the summit with some success. With Hesperia's death, Dovin Bon has assumed leadership of the Azorius, and I understand his position as Supreme Judge is only awaiting confirmation by the Senate. He has been most accommodating and remains convinced that cooperation is the best way to meet Bolas' threat. Aureli of the Boros Legion also said her firm commitment to continuing the negotiations. Kaya of the Orzov and Lazov of the Demir have expressed similar sentiments. Ral tried not to let his expression shift at this last. I still don't don't trust trust Lazov. Lazov. And Hakara has communicated with Rakdos himself and assures me that the demon remains willing to assist us. Six guilds. And the rest? The Simic have retreated to their Zonots and raised their defenses, refusing all communications. Amara of the Slesnia says that with Trostani still... at odds, forces counseling caution have gained the upper hand. She offers neutrality, but nothing more. Niv's huge eyes bored into him. Ral felt sweat beating on his forehead. The Gruul have appeared to have suffered some sort of leadership struggle in the aftermath of the summit. Lord Borigmos has fallen, and we do not yet know who has taken his place. But the clans seem agitated, and the raids at the border of the rubble belts have increased. Aurelia has promised to increase patrols and step up her defenses. And Vraska? No one has seen Vraska since the night of the summit. But reports from the Undercity are that the Golgari Swarm is mobilizing for war. We need all ten guilds to amend the Guild Pact. Including ourselves, then. We have six, with two neutral and two actively hostile to our cause. Yes, Guildmaster. In other words, you have failed. There was a loose board just beside the bed where Ral and Harith spent so many nights that, Ral had to admit, had been at least diverting. Ral set down the bag that contained his few possessions and levered the plank out with a dagger. In the space between the top floor and the one below was a canvas sack which clinked dully as Ral extracted it. It was half full of the strange, rod-shaped silver tokens that passed for coins here, the wages of months of theft, sabotage, and occasional violence. There was also the black notebook. Ral had watched Harith scribble in it when he thought no one was looking. 
He'd finally stolen a glance a week before, after getting his lover blind drunk on fortified wine. The book had Harith's list of contacts, his potential targets, ways in and ways out, secrets, and who might be most vulnerable to their use. A treasure trove for another time. Raoul tucked the book under his arm, stowed the money in his bag, and replaced the floorboard. He stole out of the building as quietly as possible. Harith was out on a job tonight, and Raoul had pleaded illness. With any luck... You know, I didn't want to believe it. Raoul paused on the landing leading to the stairs. Harith was waiting one flight below. Two hulking thugs in street leathers backed him up. A big, heavily tattooed man with a cudgel and a lanky minotaur with enormous, scarred fists. I thought we had a pretty good deal. You had your 25%, didn't you? You had protection, a place to sleep, someone to sleep with. He stepped forward. That wasn't good enough for you? It's time for me to move on. And we both know you couldn't just let me do that. Not with what I've seen. Why move on? Harith fixed him with a gaze that was half furious, half despairing. He actually actually cares. cares. Raoul forced another smile and shrugged. The fool. Harith scowled and jerked his head, and the two thugs came forward. Raoul spread his hands, as though bidding them to wait. On his pack, the thing he'd spent the last month building, a jury-rigged mess of wire and steel plates, whirred jerkily to life. Power crackled through him, the kind of energy he'd normally only get by standing in a thunderstorm. He grinned at Harith's hired muscle as he closed his hands into fists, and white sparks crawled out along his fingers. I've got nothing left to learn here. Not yet. He wasn't an expert on reading draconic expressions, who was, but he was fairly sure niv was surprised. The dragon's long tongue flicked out, and his lips pulled back to bare sword-sized teeth. Explain. Bring it in! Raoul shouted toward the doors. His goblin assistants scuttled in, nearly frozen in obvious terror of the dragon. Under Niv's impassive gaze, they deposited their rolled papers at Raoul's feet, and he gestured for them to spread the things out on the floor. After a certain amount of confusion and argument, goblins were goblins even under the eyes of the Firemind, they assembled the sheets in the proper order. What took shape was a huge map of the 10th district, detailed enough to show every alley. Drawn on top of the street plan was a complex network of colored lines, thick and interconnected in some areas, sparse in others. The basic shape of it was familiar, of course. The implicit maze, the contest Beleren had somehow managed to win and become the Living Guild Pact, only to abandon that responsibility when Ravnica needed him. This map, though, was much more detailed, and assembling it had consumed much of Raoul's attention for the past week. The Power Network. He did not sound impressed. Indeed. Which is, as we learned, the underlying structure of the Guild Pact itself. It's laid out in the city, all around us, nodes and lines linked to create the power that binds us all. All this is well known to me. I watched Azor lay the foundations. Ral nodded. Azor stipulated that all ten guilds be in agreement to change the Guild Pact. But that rule is part of the Guild Pact itself which means it is embodied in these lines of power, just like all the rest. If we can't meet the Guild Pact's conditions, then we must simply evade them. Evade them? You think you can tamper with Azor's work? Only superficially. Ral ran a hand through his hair, raising sparks, and walked across the vast map. We can construct artificial lines of energy to alter the design. Most of the technology is already in place, power condensers, a resonating chamber, mesium coal batteries. It only needs to last for a moment. A machine that will span the 10th district. The greatest creation the Izzet have ever attempted. 
and this thing. It will allow you to alter the guild pact, enable my ascension, without the consent of all the guilds? Yes. There are just a few trifling difficulties to overcome. Such as? Raoul looked down at the map. There are a limited number of effective configuration of nodes. The resonating stations must be very precisely placed across the district. And finding an arrangement that avoids the territory of Simic, Selesnia, Gruul, and Golgari has been... well, impractical. Niv's head snaked forward. Hmm... These red markings are your current plan? Yes. Simic and Selesnia may come to their senses, but we can't count on it. Not in time. This arrangement requires only nodes in Gruul and Golgari territory. Here, and here. The Gruul and the Golgari will not simply allow us the use of these nodes. No, they will not. So we'll just have to take them by force. A conference room in Nivix, more commonly occupied by a half dozen chemisters plotting some deadly mischief, had been hastily appropriated for a council of war. Rao sat at the head of a long stone table, scarred and discolored by decades of experiments. On his right, the angel Aurelia stood with her arms folded, watching the others with blank, glowing eyes. Her second, the Minotaur woman Commander Fergin, sat in a bulky chair and wore an expression of unabashed suspicion. Opposite the Boros contingent were the Azorius representatives. The Vidalcan planeswalker Dovin Bon, now that guild's leader, looked back at Aurelia with equal imperturbability. At his side was a young woman in silver armor he'd introduced as Hussar Captain Vel who stood so painfully upright that Raoul's back hurt in sympathy. Finally, at the other end of the table, Kaya lounged in her chair, a broad smile on her face. A pinch-faced priest in black robes sat beside her, glaring as though he'd like to start scolding, but she didn't seem inclined to pay him any mind. Raoul glanced at the door one last time, sighed, and put his hands on the table. <sighs> Well, we might as well get started. Our company is not complete. I assumed the rest of our allies would be joining us. Small loss. Lazav has already sent word that his agents will be available to help gather intelligence. But direct combat isn't their specialty. As for the Rakdos, where is Hikara anyway? Normally, she was impossible to keep from getting underfoot. I don't think they'll be missed at a planning session. We'll see them when the fighting starts, I imagine. And you're certain there's no other way? Not in the time we have left to us. The Firemind has directed that all Izzet resources be committed to this project. We will have the Resonators assembled and ready. For the nodes we control, it's a simple matter of installing them and linking them to the Master Node here at Nivix. But we must have two more. He pushed a map of the 10th District, annotated it in pencil across the table. Here? And here. And it seems unlikely we'll be able to take either of them peacefully. Fergin tapped the map with one clawed finger. Certainly not this one. That part of the rubble belt has changed hands a dozen times in the last two years as it is. And the other is the Undercity. Which means Vraska will be in an excellent position to try and stop us. Ral nodded. Fortunately, united, we should have the strength to seize both nodes. And with any luck, our enemies won't realize their importance. He looked around the table. It should go without saying that the nature of our objective should not leave this room. The Gruul will fight, because that is their nature. However, if we defeat them in the initial encounter, they are unlikely to counterattack. Instead, they will search for weaker targets to raid. There are several garrisons within an easy march of this node, and we conducted operations against the Gruul regularly. We should be able to field a sizable force without raising any eyebrows. Good. I'd like to suggest that the Boros provide the bulk of our forces on the surface, then, with Izzet and Azorius providing a few elite units to assist. I will join you myself, of course. 
That should be enough to send the savages scurrying. Fergin grinned at the prospect. Do not underestimate the gruel. They are cannier than they appear. We won't. As for the Undercity operation, that's where you come in. He looked across the table at Kaya. I was hoping we could rely on the Orzov for support underground. Hmm? Kaya blinked, looking distracted. Of course, uh, whatever you need. Guildmaster, perhaps a more limited commitment. Whatever you need, and I'll be there. Guildmaster, please. Your safety is paramount. I owe Rao for his help, and I pay my debts. Good. I'm going to ask Takara for Rakdos help there too. And Vraska is more than likely to try something clever after we take the node, so we'll need to fortify our position. Our people can handle that. With help from our Boros friends, of course. The Minotaur bristled, but Aurelia only nodded. Okay. I know what happened to Asperia was a shock. But we always knew Bolas had allies here. And now they've revealed themselves. All that's left is to crush them. He looked around the table. Thank you for your commitment to Ravnica. Of course. What other course could we take after all? Done. Nivix was still a hive of activity, but none of it required Raoul's attention. The great machine was under construction in dozens of labs and workshops, pieces being forged and welded that, when finally assembled, would create forces that would stitch the Tenth District together into a single vast work of magic. The work of Azor himself, tweaked and modified by the combined genius of hundreds of the Izzet's best. Raoul felt a fierce pride in his guild, his adopted home. We'll, we'll make, make it. it. The thought of his bed was suddenly unbelievably appealing. Raoul got up from his desk with a groan as his aching body complained, stretched, and stumbled toward the door. Plans for the attack on Gruul territory were well underway, with Aurelia handling the tactical details. Raoul would be the first to admit he was no military expert, so he was happy to leave those matters to the Angel and her subordinates. So there's, so there's no, no harm, harm in me getting, getting some sleep. sleep. In the corridor outside his office, though, a thin figure sat cross-legged against the wall. <sighs> Hakara? She didn't move, and he prodded her with his boot. Hey, Hakara, wake up. I didn't do nothing! No one said you did. Sorry, I was waiting for you to finish. Raoul held out a hand, and she took it and pulled herself up. Her skinny frame seemed to weigh almost nothing. She gave him a smile, as always, but there was a strain at the edges that felt off. You, uh, missed the strategy meeting. I'd have just died of boredom. His stompiness says just tell us when you want our help against the gruel or... Hikara? What's wrong? I just... Ain't there a way we can work things on with Vraska? Vraska is working for Bolas. She betrayed all of us at the Guild Summit. She killed the Supreme Judge of the Azorius. What? I know. I know all that, but she's our mate, Rao. We fought with her. You don't go against your mates. Not ever. That's just the way it is. I understand. I... Raoul put a hand on her shoulder and lowered his voice. I thought I could trust her. A rare thing. The old Raoul, the Raoul of his dreams, had decided never to trust anyone. With the help of Tomek and a few others... Even Hakara, odd as that seems. He'd thought that was beginning to change. But now... She hasn't given us any choice. Bolas is coming. And if we're going to stop him, we need those nodes. If Raska tries to stop us, that makes her the enemy of all of Ravnica. Yeah, but... never mind. She turned dejectedly and walked away. Raoul looked after her for a moment, and then <sighs> sighed and headed for the stairs.
Thank you for listening to this production of Voice of All. As listener-supported entertainment, we rely on you not just for the voices of the characters, but also to keep us going and growing. If you enjoyed what you heard, please support us by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, or following us on Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, and Google Podcasts, or just plain sharing with your friends. You can also support us financially on Patreon for exclusive perks. The Gathering Storm was written by Django Wexler. The podcast was produced and edited by Gin Keshi, with sound editing by Grace Noir. This week's story featured the voice talents of Mycroftian, Miles Miller, Biomancer, Noxshade, Melissa Sheldon, David Ford, Ash Thurman, Joe Loaf, Emily Doms, Penny, Rhythm Bastard, Nilani, and Violet Legacy. Voice of All is unofficial fan content, permitted under the Wizards of the Coast fan content policy. Magic the Gathering is copyright Wizards of the Coast. Thanks so much for listening. Y'all have a great day.